I get a lot of comments from people saying stuff like, love the video, would never make the recipe though because it has like 14 ingredients in it. And I get it, most people aren't gonna spend 90 bucks tracking down like 14 things to make some advanced recipe. So for everybody else out there who's just trying to make something nice for their family to eat, today I'm gonna show you guys five weeknight Mexican dishes that are super easy to make, take only 15 to 35 minutes, and most importantly, require only five ingredients each. To clarify, when I say ingredient in this video, I'm referring to a fresh thing that you bought recently. What doesn't count is spices, salt, oil, vinegar, hot sauce, or any pantry stuff that you would normally have on hand. Up first is the simplest and fastest dish in this video. To make it into a food processor, I'll combine one can of black beans with a second can of black beans that's not drained. The bean liquor will help thin out the bean puree. Next in goes five grams of salt, 10 grams of onion powder, 10 grams of ground cumin, and five grams of garlic powder. Now the lid goes on and I'll spin these beans for about 30 seconds until they're pretty smooth looking. And if you don't have a food processor, you could just smash these beans up in the saute pan when you refry them. Next, I'll grab a large nonstick pan and drop it on the stove over medium high heat. Once that's hot, in goes a bunch of olive oil. Then I'll scoop in my seasoned bean puree and fry it in the oil for about 10 minutes, stirring frequently. Frying the beans and spices in the fat like this makes them taste a lot better. The beans especially lose that tinny, thin canned flavor and they pick up more of a savory edge. And after a few minutes of cook time, these beans have reduced a little bit and the spices smell super fragrant. Note, these beans are gonna thicken as they sit, so they should be a little bit thinner than you think at this point. When it's time to serve, I like to add a little bit of extra acidity in the form of lime juice, but if you wanna play strictly by the rules of pantry only, the acidity that I would use is cider vinegar. Now to plate this up, I'll drop four corn tostada shells into a 350F oven to reheat and toast for about five minutes. By the way, we made enough refried beans for eight tostadas in total. To serve this, I'll drop a very generous dose of my refrieds on top of my hot tostada shell and smear that around. Then I'll top that with some perfectly square diced fresh avocado, then four to five sliced cherry tomatoes. This will bring some nice moisture and texture to bring contrast to that soft avocado and the refrieds. And then the fifth ingredient here is crumbly salty feta cheese. To top this, I'll grab some taco sauce or some hot sauce from the fridge to bring a little additional heat and acidity. And that's a weeknight tostada supreme made with just five ingredients or six if you count half of a lime. Oh. Either way, this dish is fast, easy to make, and it's delicious enough where you won't get sick of it if you make it two or three times a week. Mm. That is everything I want out of simple weeknight Mexican. Next up is a cheesy mushroom jalapeno quesadilla. To get started, I'll make the sauteed veggie filling. For that, I'll medium dice one large onion. Yellow or white would work fine here, and in total, I need roughly 225 grams. Next up is mushrooms. I've got one pound or about 450-ish grams here, and I'll cut those in into thick slices. I'll cut those slices in half, then I'll cut those down into a medium small dice. Think of a size that'll fit comfortably suspended in melted cheese between two halves of a folded tortilla. Next, I'll take 75 grams of pickled jalapenos and dice them mediumly. I tried this recipe with fresh jalapeno, but it lacked acidity. These pickled peppers help balance the fatty richness of the quesadilla cheese. And once I've got my veggies cut up into a large saute pan, I'll add a lot of olive oil, then my mushrooms and a strong pinch of salt. Quick tip. Cook your mushrooms for longer than you think. Most people don't like mushrooms because they're chewy and wet. I call that undercooked. Mushrooms this size need at least 10 to 15 minutes of cook time to lose their water and reach a texture that humans would find enjoyable. And once these mushrooms are golden brown, I'll add in all of my onions, a pinch of salt, and then I'll stir to combine and cook for five to seven more minutes. From here on out, I'm gonna cook this over medium heat to avoid over caramelizing the onion because that'll make the quesadilla too sweet. And after a few more minutes, I've got soft onions and tender mushrooms, so I'll add in all of my chopped jalapeno, then stir. I just wanna combine these with the mushrooms and take off their chill. The veggie mix goes off heat for a second while I grab a big floppy flour tortilla. First thing down is a big grip of the only true quesadilla cheese I know, Chihuahua. <laughs> I think that's how you say it. This cheese was designed to be melted between tortillas, you guys. It's mild in flavor, it's creamy and super stretchy. Sub in a Mexican blend, of course, if that's what you have or what you prefer. Next, I'll add in a lot of my mushroom mix, maybe three quarters of a cup's worth. Then another big handful of cheese, maybe about a cup and a half per quesadilla. Then one last big scoop of veggies. Next, I'll fold this thing up, move it over to a medium heat 12 inch saute pan, add in a lot of oil, 
more than you think, then I'll drop in my folded tortilla. Note, I'm swirling the bottom edge of this thing to make sure I've got even coverage. And once this tortilla is in the pan, I'll come back with my largest spatula and gently press it down to ensure deep, intimate pan contact. This will prevent splotchy, uneven browning and give us a perfectly crisp quesadilla. Now, while this cooks, I'm gonna thank Maiden for making this perfect 12 inch quesadilla melting pan and for sponsoring this video. If you've been watching this channel for a while, you've probably noticed that over the last couple of years, I've switched pretty much all of my cookware to Maiden. Maiden has become my go-to cookware brand because they design professional quality products for the home cook that are so functional and heavy duty that they're also used in multiple three Michelin starred restaurants like Alinea in Chicago. That's a big deal. You guys know that I love the functionality and easy cleanup of a nonstick pan, and I fully endorse Maiden's nonstick line, but Maiden's stainless clad line is actually my favorite. The 12 inch fry pan that I'm using to crisp this quesadilla is the same one that I used earlier to perfectly saute that mushroom mix. The curved walls on this pan are specifically calculated for deeper searing and easy toss, toss, tossing. And thanks to that premium five ply stainless steel on all sides, not just the bottom, I'm getting even heating, great heat retention, and great control for a crispy, perfectly golden brown quesadilla. To pick up a few pieces of made-in cookware or completely upgrade your whole setup, head to my link in the description below to save on your order. Thank you, Made In. And after two minutes of fry time, I'll peek under the first side to see how it looks. And that looks great. So I'll flip it over and continue to press this down and fry over medium heat for two more minutes. The keys to a perfectly brown quesadilla are constant, gentle downward pressure and plenty of oil on the pan side. And once it's cooked, look at this thing. The tortilla is fried, it's flaky, and it's a little bit sweet. The filling is earthy, creamy, and gooey. The jalapeno brings that perfect dose of briny heat with just a little bit of acidity and the mushrooms have a meaty, firm texture that's perfect with the melty cheese. Oh my God. Honestly, who needs a grilled cheese when a quesadilla is on the menu? It's peak melt. Up next is a simple but effective chicken enchilada that ditches the lasagna style bake for a process that's cleaner and honestly better. To get started, I'll combine one 400 gram can of tomato sauce with five grams of salt, five grams of sugar, 10 grams of white distilled vinegar, 40 grams of chipotle and adobo. Oh! Oh no! <laughs> oh shit. It's spicy, dude. I'm all right. 50 grams of chili powder, and then 400 grams of water, or roughly one empty tomato sauce can's worth. Of course, if you don't have a big blender like this one, you could spin this up with an immersion blender or throw everything into a food processor, no problem. And once I've got my spicy chili flavored enchilada sauce, I'll grab one large rotisserie chicken and pick off all the meat. How much meat you get will definitely depend on your bird's size, but in total to make 12 to 16 enchiladas, you'll need about 400 to 450 grams of meat. And once this meat is picked off, I'll run my knife through it three or four times to break it down into small pieces that are roughly the size of crumbled feta cheese. Next, I'll combine the 400 grams of picked and chopped chicken meat with 200 grams of shredded Mexi blended cheese and roughly 200 grams of the enchilada sauce. I'll give that a quick stir to combine and mention that combining the meat, cheese, and sauce together helps keep everything glued together once we reach full melt and helps us avoid my pet peeve with enchiladas, which is stuff falling out of the sides when you lift it out of the pan. Now to build these things, I'll drop some corn tortillas into a large pan to heat them up to make them pliable. And once these tortillas are warmed through and stacked up on a plate, I'll grab my sauce and a brush and then coat the tortillas with one to two tablespoons of sauce per side. I'll flip this over, then paint the back side real quick. Then I'll grab about a half cup's worth of filling, tuck it into a straight line, then roll up the tortilla. From here, I'll scoot all of my rolled up enchiladas to the same pan that I used to heat the tortillas and tidy them up into a line with the bottom seam tucked up underneath. Next, I'll pour about a cup's worth of sauce right on top to further saturate the tortillas with chili flavor. Then I'll brush that to cover and make sure that it's evenly spread. Next, I'll scoot this pan under my broiler about eight inches away. This pan can go up to 500 F by the way, which is where my broiler is. But if yours gets hotter, you may want to use a stainless steel pan. And after two to three minutes of broiling, I'll pull this out and you can see the sauce is nicely baked onto the tortillas and the cheese inside is just starting to melt. To finish, I'll slather on just a little bit more sauce. Then I'll top this whole thing with a couple liberal grips of standard issue shredded Mexi cheese. Chihuahua would also be a good choice if you bought that for quesadillas and had it left over. Okay, back under the broiler for another two minutes just to finish melting the cheeses. And then we'll cut to that glorious melt shot. 
Ooh, baby. You guys, this is an easier, cleaner way to make delicious enchiladas. The more standard issue mom way is basically the same amount of work as lasagna. And while that's good, it's messy and sloppy and it's more of a weekend dish. These enchiladas are just as melty, just as cheesy, but they're put together so much better. Flavor wise, you get some dark, smoky chipotle flavor. You get that earthy corn flavor from the tortillas. And of course you get the exhilarating dumb fun of melted Monterey Jack cheese. Make these soup. Soon. You're gonna be stoked. Okay, recipe four uses the crock pot to make an approximation of al pastor tacos. To get started, I'll grab three pounds of boneless pork shoulder. If you don't eat pork, this recipe would also work with beef chuck or chicken thighs. Now, I'll just cut the pork into six to eight large chunks. I go with three inch pieces here because those become pull apart tender in about one eight hour work day's worth of cooking, so they'll be ready when I'm ready to make dinner. Next, I'll slide this pork into the slow cooker, then top with 30 grams of salt, five grams of cumin, five grams of oregano, 10 grams of paprika, 30 grams of chili powder, a couple bay leaves if you've got them. Then because this is al pastor, the juice from two cans of pineapple. I'll save the pineapple part for the taco filling later on. Once the pork is covered in spiced fruit juice, I'll pop the lid on my crock pot, then slow cook for seven to nine hours. Eight hours later or after work, I'll check back and you can see that this meat has cooked down quite a lot and we've got some really flavorful looking cooking juices. To test for tenderness, I'll grab two forks and just pull this meat apart. Part. Textually, I want it to come apart easily, but I don't want it too soft and mushy. Next, I'll take out about half of the meat and run my knife through it two or three times to break it down. I'll freeze the other half of the meat in its cooking liquid for future taco pleasures. Size-wise, I want pork that's kinda small because in my opinion, that fits in a tortilla much better than larger shreds of meat. The last little bit of prep here is to take some of that canned pineapple that I harvested the juice from earlier and cut it into small pieces. For that, I'll just quarter the rings, then cut those quarters down into eighths. For six to eight tacos, I need about a cup to a cup and a half of chopped pineapple. Now to turn all of this into taco filling, I'll grab a large nonstick pan, in this case 12 inches, and heat it up over medium high heat. Once that's hot, in goes a long squiggle of oil, then my chopped pineapple, and I'll caramelize this for two to three minutes. I'm trying to recreate the charred vibe that pineapple gets while sitting on top of the El Pastor spit called the trompo. And once the pineapple has taken on some nice caramelization, I'll add in my chopped pork and fry everything for about three to five minutes to crisp it up around the edges. This gives the pork a carnitas vibe that tastes very good, and it also helps bring some more complicated flavors to the final dish. Slow cooked pork right out of the crock pot is a little bit one note and kind of wet tasting. Speaking of wet, once this pork is taken on a little crispness, I'll add in three to four small ladles worth of the cooking liquid, maybe about 100 grams or about a cup. This will overall lube up the taco filling, making it really juicy and unctuous, but it also brings that dark chili flavor to the table that we're looking to help mimic the al pastor. I'll give this a few tosses now to make sure everything's getting coated, then I'll cook down the liquid until the pork juice has turned into more of a glaze on the meat. To plate this up, I'll set up three double stacks of hot and floppy corn tortillas, then I'll fill each one with three to four four ounces of pork and pineapple. I'll top that with ingredient four, small diced onion. By the way, I rinsed this onion under the sink to remove any of that raw sulfury edge that gives you dragon breath. And then finally, ingredient five is a ton of chopped fresh cilantro. I also like to hit these with either a squeeze of lime or some kind of smoky chili based hot sauce from the fridge. And that's a simple al pastor-ish taco that you can make with about 20 minutes of active work. Start it in the morning and then be eating tacos within 20 minutes of walking in the door after after work. It's fruity, it's porky, it's fresh, and it's bright. Authentic? No, but this is a Wednesday night taco that tastes like one you'd have on vacation. Okay, I saved my favorite recipe for last. This is my weeknight version of arroz con pollo or chicken with rice. To get started, I'll grab five pounds of bone-in skin on chicken thighs and then preheat my oven to 450F. Into the chicken bowl, I'll combine 25 grams of olive oil, 20 grams of salt, five grams of black pepper, five grams paprika, five grams cumin, five grams turmeric, 10 grams onion powder, and five grams garlic powder. Next, I'll jump into the bowl and toss all that until the chicken is evenly coated. Then I'll grab a sheet tray, align it with foil so that it's much easier to clean later on. Then I'll put a wire rack on top of that, spray it with a liberal amount of pan spray to keep the chicken from sticking and again to make cleanup easier then i'll lay out all nine pieces of chicken thigh hey bry what about breasts yes you can sub those in but the cooking process is going to be different check out my grilled chicken video for how to cook chicken breast properly use this marinade but that cooking technique 
Good luck. Next, I'll load this chicken into my 475F oven and roast it for 30 to 35 minutes. While that cooks, I'll grab a large deep pot and drop it on the stove over medium high heat. In goes a long hit of olive oil, then 400 grams of rinsed jasmine rice. Next, I'll fry that rice in the oil, stirring frequently for about three to four minutes. I wanna cook this rice until it's translucent and smelling just a little bit toasty. Next, in goes five grams of cumin, five grams of garlic powder, two grams turmeric, two grams onion powder, and seven grams of salt. I'll just stir that in real quick and fry it with the rice for about a minute or until things are smelling cumin-y. You know, like a delicious armpit. Next, I'll add in 500 grams of standard issue chip-friendly salsa. Don't use anything thin or overly spicy here. Salsa is kind of a cheat code for squeezing in max flavor with minimal ingredients. It's one ingredient that's also like six. It's got pre-cooked onions, garlic, chilies, and tomato all existing in the perfect balance. I think they call that a Pack. Once my salsa is cooked down a little bit and rusty looking like this, I'll add in 650 grams of water, bring the whole pot up to a low simmer, then in goes 150 grams of frozen peas. Now the lid goes on and I'll throw this pot into my oven on the top rack above my chicken. 15 minutes later, I'll pull out my rice and rest it on the stove for 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, when I pop the top on this rice, you can see we've got beautiful swollen individualized grains that aren't gluey or stuck together. Now the fifth ingredient in this dish is chopped fresh cilantro. Normally my Latin rice would also get lime juice, but the beauty of this salsa is that it brings all the acidity that we need. Okay, let's check back on the chicken. After 35 minutes, you can see that looks freaking amazing. The skin is fully rendered and evenly crisp. Listen to this. Chicken and rice or a rose con pollo, you guys, is very good tasting food. It's as simple as that. I'll eat this dish happily every day of my life. Wedding day, Christmas day, Groundhog day, or the last meal on my last day. I like it a lot is all that I'm saying, and I think you will too. Let me know in the comments if this video was useful to you, and let me know which dish you might try this week. Check out this video for more weeknight meals under three bucks if you want some more ideas for weeknight cooking that's easy, cheap, and delicious. I'll see you there, and let's eat this thing.